So Cheryl, I've got to start with, um, I used to work in Dallas. I used to go to Turtle Creek all the time. I've seen these geese before. I've seen people feed the geese. I've seen people, you know, get to feel like they know these geese. I've never seen a goose come from the water, out of the water, straight to a person. What was that experience like that first time? I mean, it's surreal. It really just seems like a phenomenon. I've never seen a bird connect with someone so that hasn't rescued them or been a part of their life. Like, what was that first experience like? It's incredible. Well, you said the right word because it was surreal. And I had never really been, been around geese before. You know, I had seen ducks at the ponds and things like that. So um, it was completely a new experience for me. And, uh, and at first, I was very taken back, you know, because here comes this big goose, you know, honking so loud and, and coming right towards me. It scared me at first. Um, and then I realized he was friendly and it, it just took me back that, that he was following me around. He wouldn't leave me. Um, and so I talked for him a little bit and, and I just thought, you know, I guess he's gotten really used to humans being here at the pond. And so then I, I just thought, okay, but I didn't realize the extent of it until I started to walk home. Mm. And he crossed the street to follow me. And when he was running down the middle of Turtle Creek Boulevard, stopping traffic, um, then I knew, like, this is incredibly unusual. When you first started posting, I mean, we've been following you for years. We've known you. So we've been there from the beginning. I think everyone thought, well, that's kind of cute. That's kind of really interesting and neat. But then we saw this bird really connect with you, and you continue to post. You continue to do it. As far as deciding to stick with this and make this something, whatever it was, whatever was going to come about, what made you want to continue to get to know this bird and feel that you could? I mean, the bird kept coming back, honk mm -hmm. kept coming back to you. That's got to be something in itself was kind of, okay, I've got to do this. This bird is connecting with me. Right. Well, you know, to be honest, I might not have gone back. Mm -hmm. I, you know, once I got him back to the pond, I was like, okay, he's back at the pond. He's safe. I had it home. Um, it wasn't until a friend of mine in New York named Judy saw the video that I had posted, and she called me and said, Cheryl, that goose doesn't belong there. And I was like, what do you mean? And she said, it's not a wild goose. It's a domestic goose. And I was uned uneducated. I did not know what that meant. And she explained it to me that there are wild geese and there are domestic geese and that honk had more than likely been dumped there. So she was like, you have to help this goose because he's obviously in distress and reaching out to people. That's the reason I went back and then, you know, and, and stayed with him and got to know him and really find out about his journey and why he was there because I realized um, that he needed help. And Mary Beth was one of the first people I reached out to because my friend Judy said there is a dear friend of mine here in New York who rescues waterfowl, domestic waterfowl, on a daily basis in Brooklyn and in New York City, and you need to talk to her. So I gained so much knowledge talking to Mary Beth on what I should and shouldn't do for honk. Um, and so th that's the reason I went back was when I realized he was domestic and was not a wild goose and shouldn't be there. Mary Beth, I'd love for you to, to kind of talk a bit about geese in New York and the problem that it is. I don't think people realize how much waterfowl are in the state. I mean, there's lakes all around. There's, there's, there's places for these birds to be and they get stuck in the city. I mean, you, I've, you've, I've seen your videos of them just walking in Brooklyn streets. It's insane. Um, can you talk a bit about that issue and how you got into that and how Cheryl's story kind of, that's why I connected with you. Um, I've been a wildlife rehabber for, um, I guess, 10 years or so, um, but I've always been watching out for the wildlife in New York City, and we're on the Atlantic Flyway, so they're coming and going constantly, and so the New York City parks are a real um, 
valued place for them. They need to rest before they move on. That's that's the uh, the wild geese. Um, so we watch out for them. You know, we just make sure that they're healthy. We come into a lot of issues where there's fishing line. The birds get caught in fishing line, fish hooks. Um, lots of different issues. But then we have the issue of the domestic birds that are dumped around New York City parks. Um, I have a rescue group called They All Want to Live, and uh, two very dear people that I've learned everything from, Caroline Lee and um, Jessica Zafonte, the three of us, we go around the city and we're constantly finding dumped domestic waterfowl like honk. Um, I recently found a uh, a female version of honk, I think a different uh, breed, um, down at the Brooklyn waterfront. She was dumped back in August. And what happens is people buy them as pets, or sometimes they get them from live markets and they think that they're going to set them free. So this particular goose that looked just like honk, when the Canada geese left for um, the fall, she was left behind. So I had to go and rescue her. She's living in Virginia right now. But what we're finding is that people will go and buy ducks um, at Easter time. Um, schools do hatching projects, and when the hatching project is done, and you know the kids see that the eggs hatch and there's your little life there, what are you going to do with the ducks or the geese or the chicks? They will dump them outside, thinking that they will be okay. And what I find in Brooklyn, in Prospect Park, that's my main area, and Central Park, they let them go, thinking that they'll be okay with other wild waterfowl and it's not the case. They can't fly. They can't find food. They can't escape predators. And that's what happened with Honk. He was left there and looking for for someone, looking for food, whatever. Um, we encountered that, but I've never encountered... <laughs> encountered a goose that was so friendly and most of the time they're so frightened that we can't it takes months for us to rescue them so honk was a very special mm -hmm. goose i've never seen anything <laughs> like that that's what we do so it's it's a constant issue and we're trying to actually work on a bill in new york city right now to um to help these birds that are constantly being dumped like honk and they could be geese, they could be chickens, they could be ducklings or adult ducks. I'd love for um, a local perspective, Kathy, you've been dealing not just with waterfowl, but birds and animals of all kinds for 40 years now. And you know full well the impact of the hatchling issue, of the domestic animal issue. Can you talk a bit about, we were just sharing your numbers for the last, you know, numbers of animals coming in recently. How big of a problem is this? How crazy is it? I mean, you're there every day dealing with this. It, it's a huge problem. Uh, we do close to 6,000 birds a year come through our facility. And quite a few of them, especially this time of the year, are ducks. In fact, we got two yesterday, little ducklings that were probably a month old at the most that were dumped at a park. And one of my volunteers happened to be there and they ran to her so it's already starting and it's it's a problem every year which is the school hatching is one of my pet peeves there's certainly other ways to educate the children besides i mean to me you should be teaching them that life that if you're going to have it you, it's a responsibility and a commitment and not well when you're tired of it you just go dump it somewhere to me it's teaching children the whole wrong message but that's my opinion. <laughs> um, as far as it being, it's almost every day. We get these creatures that are adults that have been dumped at a park that don't know to be afraid of a dog because they were raised with the family dog. And people like to run their dogs on the ducks that are sitting on the bank. And then the predators get them. And it's usually not a good outcome. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, until people understand that you can't just put it out there and expect it to act wild. It's not the way it works. It's going to be a problem. Cheryl, how did you connect with Kathy? Well, when I had gotten to the part of Honk's journey together where um, I realized he was completely alone because I had found his mate passed away on her nest. Um, that's when I knew then I had to rescue him. And 
I did not know of Rogers Wildlife, but a friend of mine who had been following his story said you should check out Kathy Rogers and Rogers Wildlife. And so I was so incredibly grateful because I called Kathy and I told her about Honk and she said, if you can get him, you can bring him. And um, I said, I'd love to come out and check out the place first. And so I went out and I met Kathy and her incredible staff and her volunteers. And, and I knew, you know, it would be the perfect home for Honk. And it was 15 minutes from where I lived so I could continue my relationship with him and so um, you know and I had to tell Kathy I said look this isn't just a just a goose I'm bringing in I mean this is kind of a celebrity goose so um, I said a lot of eyes are on this goose around the world um, and he has a lot of attention and so that attention then of course went on to Rogers um, but Kathy was like you know absolutely bring him so that that's how I found out about Rogers Let's talk about that celebrity element. Um, going from just your viral videos, Lauren's involvement at Fox 4. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about that, but also we'll jump to Dodo in a minute. That must have been whirlwind. But locally, when Lauren and the, the local press got a hold of this story, it must have been surreal. You, you were put in the spotlight for this. Yes. Um, you know, I didn't start out to make a film about Honk. Um, when I knew I needed to go back and, and be with him because he was a domestic goose, the reason I had so many weeks to spend with him was because after talking with Mary Beth, I had learned um, from some people at the park that he did have this mate. And apparently, you know, they said she was up the creek sitting on a nest. So when I had, had told Mary Beth about that, she said, well, okay, that raises the stakes here. You cannot take him uh, to a, a sanctuary without his mate. And if she's on you know, a nest and has eggs, that's another whole issue. Well, I looked for her and I couldn't find her. So that's the reason I had these, you know, eight, 10 weeks with Honk, because I couldn't take him until I could find her. Um, so I decided to just, you know, do these videos. It was giving people joy. We were on lockdown. And, um, and it was just going to be a social media aspect. And and I talked to Mary Beth and I said, you know, it's a way to raise awareness about these dump ducks and the trash that was at the park and, um, you know, just the, the plight that these domestic waterfowl face. And, and so that was the purpose. But I did not realize it was going to start to go viral. And so many people were going to, uh, you know, jump on this honk story. And Lauren, um, her children became huge honk fans. And so Lauren asked if she could cover the story on Good Day. And of course, I said yes. I thought, well, it's a great opportunity to raise more awareness. And when that started, then I that you know the filmmaker then in me kicked in and i thought oh you know maybe i can take this story bigger to raise more awareness um for the honks out there and that's how that started and then and i started zooming with school you know classes and girl scout troops and everything um and then it went to the next level because the, the wonderful Dallas Bathhouse Cultural Center here um, had Honk and I Zoom with one of their children's theater programs. And after that, they said, we would like to give you a grant to make the film. And so uh, that was another level. And then the Dodo contacted me and, and said they wanted to do a video. And I distinctly remember um, talking to my wife, Natalie, before I said yes to them. And I said, the Dodo is huge. And, and if we do this, there, he could really go viral. And I needed to know whether sort of I was prepared for that and um, what kind of risk that might put Honk in and that sort of thing. So I agreed to do it, but um, I would not give out his location. Mm -hmm. And um, and I never did in any of the videos. They knew it was Turtle Creek, but as you know, it's a bigger area. So um, I didn't want to put him in harm's way just you know, because he was getting popular. But then the dodo happened, and it's been seen by over 34 million people. And, and that's when it just skyrocketed. You know, the film showcases it's global. 
Mm-hmm. There's uh, the interview with the the Australian girl. Mm-hmm. There's tweets from Pakistan, England, all over the yeah. around the world. How inspiring has Honk been, not only for you, but knowing that this story has impacted so many different people. His life has really become something endearing for people to look at. You know what? Honk went far beyond just rescuing a goose, which that's important enough, right? Um, But there were two aspects. We had the raising awareness and the education that we want to do about domestic ducks and geese. But then honk became a movement um what what honk represented he started to be this this comfort uh this healing uh type of energy and force for people and i believe it was because of the time um being behind closed doors behind masks feeling isolated um and so divided and such a divisive time in the world people needed to feel like they could come together regardless of any type of divisions that we make for each other um, and come together in love. And and Honk really represented that. And I've had followers of his tell me that the word they, they keep coming back to is divine, that there was something divine about Honk and, and our journey together. And... Um, I truly believe that because, you know, there's hashtags out there that are like, be strong like honk, love like honk. And his fans aren't going anywhere. You know, he's physically not here, but his spirit and what he stood for still is. And um, all I can just say is it was completely magical. And I will I will give you an example and um, and I'm probably going to share this uh, before the screening. Um, yesterday, I received a private message on Instagram, on Honk's Instagram, from one of his fans. And it said, um, I want to thank you for the Honk videos and still posting. They are giving my children comfort and helping them stay calm during air raids the ukraine loves honk Mm. and you know um you it's it's overwhelming but this you know this goose is still helping heal and give love and comfort to people worldwide so i think sometimes you just can't put words on it um why this particular story did that for people but i think it's a combination of a pandemic of isolation of division and this goose came along and and people jumped on board um and tapped into love wow that's incredible yeah um i'd 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 love to kind of end things by for you two in particular, you getting to know Honk, but Mary Beth, you getting to see him from afar, getting to see these videos, getting to see the growth from a, an early stage. How has Honk impacted you and your view of animals, the animal connection with people? And do you have a memory that sticks with you now that we've lost, you know, Honk? Um being so far away but feeling so connected i mean today is the first day that i met cheryl in person and i feel like i've known her forever and natalie too and kathy as soon as i walked in i said oh there's kathy you know um but i felt like i was part of something so big and like cheryl said you can't put it into words i i do this work every day but sometimes you just don't Things don't go the way you want them to go. You don't make the impact you're hoping to make. And I think from this, um, Hank is just this amazing spirit that was here on a mission and brought so many people together. And animals do that anyway. I, I mean, I, I, I think that's why I'm, it's ingrained in me from my dad when I was really little. Um, 
and I don't know what I would do without animals in this world. And I think this will just help us, a lot of people that may not really know about different things, to just have a little more empathy and and the education will help so much. And I think it just brings about a, a, just a, a huge awareness of what animals can do for people and what people can do for animals. Mm-hmm. Kathy, I'd love for you to talk a bit about Animals have obviously been important. You don't open a rehab center, you don't live there if it doesn't mean the world to you. Saving these animals, the struggle behind that. What is your experience of helping these birds live a longer, better life? And also, do you have that significant moment of honk? I know the limited time, but just do you have a memory of him that sticks out as well? Well, I'll start with the memory. And the memory. It's not necessarily just a one incident, but every time she would come see him, that was a, a show in itself. Just that connection in that, uh, th- that's the memory I have. And as far as um, speaking to the animal connection, uh, clearly animals and people do have a connection, which unless you're like she was privileged enough to be able to experience that. You don't always know that. Um, And probably the average person wouldn't, their family pet, but as far as wild creatures are just as emotional and just as they can get attached. Um, They can hate you, they can love you, but they're very much in tune with what's going on. And I see it every day. Sure, I'd love for you to have the chance to end it by you've delivered a film for us, you delivered a book, you've delivered a social media campaign, like you said, hashtags have gone all over the place. Um, gosh, what do you think about this serendipitous thing that's happened to you? Are you is it still a shock or do you feel that it's it's worthy, it's needing this? I mean, I think people need what you've given us. Well, apparently so, I guess, you know, because of the uh, uh, the reception that, that Honk has gotten and the, uh, the movement that has started all over the world. Um, you know, f- for me personally, I've always um, had huge bonds with animals and had them growing up, and I'm a huge animal activist. I was very uneducated um, and with no experience with birds, ducks or geese. I feel very um, grateful uh, that Honk chose me uh, to be his conduit um, and to sort of tell this story. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's going to take me a while to kind of put it all in perspective. It's been truly the most unique two years of my life. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to wrap my mind all around it, but I do know um, it's going to continue. And I'm so grateful, though, that I stopped to listen to him because I think we as humans think that we talk to animals, um, but they truly talk to us, but we have to listen. And I sometimes I think, what if I wouldn't have stopped? Like, what if when I heard him honking at me and coming, I would have just been like, ha ha, you're kind of funny and walked off. And what would have happened to him? So I'm, I'm just very, very grateful that for whatever it was, um, something led me to stop and listen to him and really get to know him. Cheryl, Kathy, Mary Beth, thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to have been a part of the story of Honk. And uh, thank you for the time. Oh, thank you, Gotti. Thank you.